and I'm going to talk about the liminality of New Kingdom private vegan tombs and dance scenes. The purpose of part of my PhD research is to study the New Kingdom representations of dance painted or carved on the walls of the private vegan tombs. Through the study and classification of these scenes, we can get to understand their meaning that sometimes is related to the liminality, which means that tombs were spaces where the living and the dead could contact because they all were placed in a transitional space. It is possible to understand the meaning of these spaces and scenes when we study the common elements that appear in all of them. Thus, the comparison of these scenes is the key for the knowledge of the important meaning which inform us about the ancient Egyptian belief. During this communication, I will talk first of all of the historical and geographical setting of the private tombs my research is focused on. Secondly, I will make an approach to these buildings, data structure and decoration. Later on, I will focus on the dance scenes, which inform us about these liminal activities mentioned before. Analyzing the role of dance and music in ancient Egypt, Egypt and the scenes found on the private given tombs classified according to the context in which they appear. Starting with the historical setting after the invasion of the Hyksos in the second intermediate period, the reunification of Egypt took place during the last years of the reign of Amose, the first pharaoh of the 18th dynasty. It is the beginning of the new kingdom. This period is characterized as a time of great expansion and prosperity in Egypt. The first pharaoh of this dynasty gradually expanded the Egyptian territory and the country enjoyed a peaceful period. With Tutmose I started the Tutmosid period when an artistic boom occurred. Later on in the Amarna period, Akhenaten introduced the monotheistic cult to the god Aten. After Akhenaten framed the mysterious Smenkare to Tanhamun, with whom the country reverted back to the old traditions, the vizier Ai, and the military official Horen He, with whom the 18th dynasty ends as he had child it. In 19th and 20th dynasties are called the Ramesid period because of the name of many of the pharaohs. During this period, most of the traditional religious beliefs were restored, although some changes remained. Tradition uh, with the death of Ramesses III, the decline of the Egyptian empire began due to the division of power between the king and the priest. Moving to the geographical context, Thebes is the Greek name of the Egyptian city of Waset, the religious capital of Egypt since the beginning of the New Kingdom. The city of Thebes would correspond more or less to the area between the temples of Karnak and Luxor and would occupy both sides of the Nile River. In its western part, in an area of around two kilometers in length, there are different necropolises which were used throughout the New Kingdom by both royal, the Valley of the Kings and the Valley of the Queens, and private individuals. The private necropolis occupies the areas of Deir el Medina, Kurnet Murai, Sheikh Abel Kurna, El Joja, Deir el Bahari, Jabu el Naga, and El Asasi. Deir el Medina is the southernmost area and was the village of the workers of the royal tombs. Its necropolis was created at the beginning of the 18th dynasty. Sheikh Abel Kurna is the central section of the Theban necropolis and one of the most important areas with the largest number of tombs of the 18th dynasty. Its upper part was the first to be occupied and was used until the reign of Amenhotep III when the tombs became more complex and the availability of a space was less. So then the lower level of the hill was occupied. Another important area is Trabu and Naga to the north, where we find tombs of the Middle Kingdom, the Second Intermediate Period, and the New Kingdom. In the areas of El Koka and El Asasif, there are tombs of the 18th dynasty, although there are also tombs of other periods. Despite these divisions, it should be reminded that in ancient times, the area was conceived as a unique sacred space with the name of the West of Thieves. 
the Tiban private tombs belong to high coefficients who form an elite among the wider population. As for its function, the tomb protected the body of the deceased and served his regeneration at an eternal well-being, served as a monument to project his identity in the afterlife and commemorated him in the world of the living. On the one hand, the structure of these private tombs excavated in the mountain areas and preceded by a court followed a basic model during the 18th dynasty. This tomb layout consists of three rooms that form an inverted T. The first one, horizontal or transversal, gave way to an elongated room or corridor that gave access to a small funeral chamber or chapel. In addition, there are tombs with column rooms or with different annexed chambers that modify the basic structure described. They are called chapel tombs because they are places of both burial and funerary worship. Symbolically, they were the place of contact, of, of contact between the living and the deceased, and also between the deceased and the gods, as we will see during this communication. On the other hand, the tombs were divided into three different levels. An upper one with a structure that included a court and a facade that corresponded with functions related to the solar cult, an intermediate one that corresponded to the chapels where the cult of the deceased was celebrated and where family and friends met during different festivals, and one more internal level related to the underworld that corresponded to the burial chamber. One of the most important points for the contact between the world of the living and the world of the dead is the false door that appears in the left wall of the transverse rooms of these tombs, as this is a transition point between both worlds and the focal point of the cult. Its aspect imitating a real door and is script with the name and titles of the deceased, as well as with a list of offerings, symbolizes the door to the afterlife. The mentioned visits also explain the importance of the decoration of the first rooms, which were the meeting place, since the deepest room was sealed. Thus, the transverse hall became the public space of the tomb, where the owner would place the scenes that he considered more relevant. Within it, the, important of the, the importance of the so-called focal walls the ones that are the first to be seen entering the tombs and receive more natural light stands out. In them, the artist could place scenes of a striking aesthetic or with an important meaning, and that also offer us information about the social identity of the deceased. The carved reliefs and more frequently the paintings that decorated these tombs not only served for an aesthetic pleasure, but had a determinate purpose to create an ideal hereafter so that the deceased lived there eternally. Thus, the scenes had a magical and practical function, but they also inform us of different realities of the moment in which they were made, economic, religious. As for the distribution of the scenes, which may be funeral, religious, or biographical, there is not a fixed clear rule, but we can mention 13 trends. Normally, the biographical, professional, banquet, or offering scenes are located in the transverse hall, while the funerary scenes are found in the corridor or in the innermost room, which can also be found devoid of decoration. During the 18th dynasty, the details of the early life and the important events lived by the owner of the tomb become more common in the reliefs and paintings and pretend to leave a testimony of the life of the deceased that could be remembered by the visitors that had access to the chapel for years and had the magical function of perpetually reliving the best of their existence on earth. First, the function of the mural decoration of the Theban tombs is magical religious, but above all utilitarian due to its meaning, since they act in the service of the owner of the tomb. Otherwise, in the Ramesid period, the tomb is considered a private mortuary temple for its owner and its decoration is no longer focused on the material world or on the deceased achievements, but on religious and funeral scenes and texts, disappearing this way most of the non-sacred motifs. These spaces were thought of not only as memorials for the owners of the tombs and their families, but also as spaces to perform burial rituals and ceremonies. 
in this way the tombs were liminal spaces standing between the world of the living and the underworld. This liminality combined with the latent power of the dead meant that the tomb act as a space in which the ancestors and their descendants could come together. The survival of the deceased and his transition to the hereafter depended on the efficacy of the funerary cult and of different rituals, so the interaction between the living and the dead within the tombs takes some great importance on the occasions in which these places were accessible to different visitors, such as relatives, priests, or even other random visitors. To study music and dance in ancient Egypt, we should study the inscriptions and overall the scenes represented in some tombs and temples. They are images that represent something else than the instrument or the gestures, as they have a hidden or symbolic meaning. This meaning could be ritual in many cases, but we have to study it related to the whole scene in which the musicians or dancers are represented. Anyway, it doesn't guarantee a correct or complete interpretation. Both activities took place during religious and secular occasions, such as religious festivals, funerary processions, or military scenes. If we focus on dance, we can see a, a evolution in Egyptian dance from some conscious and undisciplined movements to more complex movements and choreographies. In any case, the dance in ancient Egypt could be done by a single member, by couples or groups, but always people of the same sex. As for its musical accompaniment, not always reflected in the scenes, we can classify the instruments into four large groups, idiophones, membranophones, aerophones, and chordophones. Going back to dance, we can classify the ancient Egyptian dance according to the context in which it appears. A first group would be the dances performed during the banquets celebrated inside or near the tombs. A second one could be the dances performed during the funerary procession, which is the journey of the deceased from his house or the manning place to the tomb. And the last one will join other dances, such as foreign dances, the religious ones, or the acrobatic dances. Many times, festivals that took place in the necropolis appear represented in the private tombs by banquet scenes in which we can see the deceased with his family and friends. They are one of the most repeated themes in the private Theban tomb of the 18th dynasty, appearing on the transversal hall of the tombs. They are among the scenes of daily life, but the truth is that they have a hidden meaning. It is intended within these scenes to remember the moments in which the deceased had participated in life so that he could repeat them in the hereafter and cross the boundaries between both worlds, that of the living and that of the dead, so that he could be in contact again with those whom he has left behind. In these banquets, we can see the deceased with his family and friends. All of them are represented in an ideal way with their funny stresses and in a state of perpetual doubt. This is the reason why we can get to the conclusion that these scenes do not represent real moments or daily activities. Instead, they have a hidden meaning. Moreover, it is strange to find within these scenes a temporary references that situate the celebration in a particular time and place. This could be due to the wish of the Egyptians of, of creating images that could serve for eternity. According to some scholars, there are two kinds of banquet scenes represented on the 18th dynasty tombs, the funerary banquets related to the burial and the mortuary banquets in which the deceased participated. On the one hand, the funerary banquet created a new stage in the relation between the deceased and his relatives, establishing the tradition to celebrate with the owner of the tomb, and then the principles of dependency and reciprocity. On the other hand, on the mortuary banquets, it's important the appearance of musicians and dancers, as well as floral necklace, lotus flowers or lilies, unguents and alcoholic beverage. 
Many of the banquet scenes are related to the beautiful Feast of the Valley, which took place on the Theban necropolis once a year. This feast, originally related to the goddess Hathor and later linked to the cult of the Theban god Amun-Re, consisted of a procession with the statue of the god Amun from Karnak that lasted two days and visited the main mortuary temples Deir el Medina, uh, sorry, Deir el Bahari, and the private necropolises. It was a very noisy event full of music that intended to wake up the deceased so that they could join the god and their relatives in this festivity. This journey symbolized the cycle of the sun entering in this way the living and the dead in contact with the moon and erasing the limits between both worlds. During this feast, visitors entered the tombs and they celebrated a banquet of which the main result was intoxication with wine, beer and some plants such as the lotus or mandrake, to transgress the borders between the earthly and the divine realms and communicate with the gods and the deceased. This act of, com of communication was even easier with the power of music, which helped the participants to relax. A common representation in these scenes is the lattice flower, which is found many times used as the headdress of the musicians, dancers, or guests. It is related to the concept of love, and it is considered as a symbol of eternal life and resurrection because it closes at night and opens again in the dawn. So it has a very important role in these banquet scenes. In addition, it was also thought that its smell had a sedative or hypnotic effect that influenced the behavior of the gods and made the communication with them much easier, something sought in the aforementioned beautiful Feast of the Valley. However, there is a theory that the pink lotus flower was not known by the Egyptians of the New Kingdom because it was introduced from India in the Persian period around the 6th century BC. What they did know were two different types of lilies, the blue lily and the white lily. It is therefore possible that the references to the lattice flower are incorrect. And in fact, we are talking about lilies. The unguent cones on the heads are related to sexuality and to the funerary context and their aroma may have helped in achieving the already mentioned intoxication. It is possible that the symbolism of the cone was associated with the transformation that enabled the living to communicate with their deceased ancestors during the beautiful feast of the Bali. They could also symbolize the presence of the Ba or soul of the deceased and the guest in the banquet, which allowed them to receive offerings and made communication between them easier. The group that dances inside these scenes is always a group of female musicians. In any case, we are talking about girls or women. This can be related to their social role, as it is possible that the profession of dancers for festivities or banquets was only a female thing. The dancers can appear dressed or naked, and they used to wear wigs, the lattice flower, and the unguent cone described as well as other ornaments. These adornments inform us about the prosperity that lives in Egypt during the New Kingdom. The little girls appear always between the musicians, something common in the representation of kids in ancient Egypt. The pose of the dancers is usually repeated, as we can see in this picture that belongs to the Theban tomb 22, a raised heel and separated and flexed legs. Some inscriptions mention their activity or even their names, but they never explain the dance they do. And that is the main reason why we can not know the moves that were made in these performances. As mentioned above, this music and dances would also make easier the transition or contact between the living and the deceased because the music will help the assistants to relax and the singers will make this transition effect more real with their songs because in ancient Egypt, everything that was pronounced existed. The dancers will also be part of this transition and could also be a personification 
of the aforementioned goddess Hathor, who was, among other things, the goddess of music and dance and the personification of the Theban necropolis. We can also see this contact between the living, the dead, and the gods on the funerary processions depicted on the private Theban tombs. In the New Kingdom, the funerary procession recreated a ritual drama alluding to the passage to the West and the deceased's union with the gods. We can find these scenes carved or painted on the corridor of the T-shaped tombs. The funerary procession depicted on these tombs finds its origin in the Old Kingdom. Its narrative structure is always partial, consisting of parts of the complete pictorial story, which consisted of 13 different episodes, beginning with the departure of the body from the place where it had been prepared, continuing with the journey down the Nile River and ending with the burial. The choice of the episodes to be represented in each tomb might have been due to the need of, to adapt the program to the available space or to the preferences of the tomb owner himself. In any case, the mummy was carried in a procession along with the funerary equipment from the house of the deceased to the tomb itself, crossing the Nile from one shore to the other. Upon death, the corpse was transported on a park across the Nile from the east, the world of the living, to the west, the land of the dead. When the procession arrived at the west shore, different rituals took place. Then, the deceased was taken to the embalming place where the process of embalming and mummification took around 70 days. After the preparation of the mummy by the embalmers, it was placed on a sledge, preferably drawn by oxen, although it could also be represented as being pulled by a group of men known as the Nine Friends. Among the people who took part in this procession, we can also identify the relatives and friends of the deceased, some priests and professional mourners. These women would play the role of the goddesses Isis and Nephthys, lamenting their deceased brother Osiris, with whom the deceased was identified. Both goddesses appear represented as kites, with Isis being the great kite and Nephthys the little kite, whose squawking was assimilated into the lament of the mourners and whose pattern of flight while looking for carrion was associated with how the loyal Isis searched for her mother, brother, and husband. Both were considered protectors of the deceased. According to Jenker, these burial rituals took the funeral procession of the king from pre-dynastic times as a model. In them, the deceased brother traveled to Buto in the Delta and Abydos in the south to visit his father Osiris, mythical king and god of death, resurrection and fertility, who was buried in the latter city. Already in the fourth dynasty, these processions ceased to be something reserved for the royalty and began to be carried out by the elite. In this pilgrimage, the cities of Buto, Saigis, and Heliopolis became fundamental centers of influence. However, in the Middle and New Kingdom, these trips seem not to have been experienced in reality, but symbolically, becoming limit to, the crossing, to crossing the Nile River from one shore to the other and performing the associated rituals, such as the purification rites, the presentation of offerings, and the opening of the mouse ceremony in the necropolis itself. It was therefore a kind of pilgrimage that symbolized the journey of the deceased into the realm of the dead, as well as his resurrection and rebirth in the hereafter. In these funeral processions, we can find some male dancers called Mu, literally those who belong to water who seemed to play a fundamental part in the ideal funeral as a procedure to which only the elite could aspire. In general, it can be said that this dance was performed at private funerals as attested from the old kingdom to the new kingdom and its frequent representation on the walls of the tombs reflect its deep theological significance. We can find these mood dancers in four different stages of the funeral procession. 
First, they received the funeral procession in the so-called Hall of the Moon, where they lived within the limits of the necropolis. Secondly, they danced when the priest carried the sarcophagus on the funeral part in a ritual place called Sais, associated with the city of Sais in the Delta. Third, they greeted the sledge that carried the sarcophagus to the ritual seat of the necropolis called the Gates of Buto. And finally, in an unknown place in the necropolis where these dancers were the reception committee for this ledge that carried the canopic vessels and the tekken. This way, the more ritualist that accompanied the coffin funeral procession represented the ancestors and welcomed the deceased at the entrance to the tombs and thence to the underworld. Generally, these dancers are depicted wearing a characteristic headdress that makes them easily recognizable. It was made with plants stalks, probably papyrus, forming a kind of cone-shaped crown that winded at the end, similar in shape to the king's white crown or the Atef crown of Osiris. However, during the New Kingdom, it seemed that scribes sometimes identified the images of the mute dancers through inscription and not through their distinctive hairdress. This is the case of the mood dancers of the third type. According to Brunner Trout's classification, there are three different types of mood dancers. The first type joined the funeral procession on the west bank of the Nile River at the entrance of the cemetery and by gesturing with their hands pointing to the floor they seem to give their permission for the procession to enter in the necropolis. The other gesture made by these dancers with their legs, with one raised foot moving, moving forward, seems to mimic the act of taking a step, which can symbolize the fact that they are crossing from the world of the living to the world of the dead. Sometimes a priest is depicted seeming to talk to them. He's a lector chief priest, who probably is invoking them. He wears a distinctive costume that crosses his chest and passes over his shoulder, and he usually appears with a roll of papyrus in his hand. The representation of these mood dancers of the first type appear mostly on the left side of the corridor of the T-shaped Theban tombs, where the funerary processions were usually depicted. In addition, they are usually orientated facing the entrance of the tomb, depicted as receiving the funeral procession as it entered the tomb and symbolically into the realm of the dead. It is remarkable with most, that most of these representations follow the same characteristic rigid style of the beginning of the 18th dynasty and that they mostly appear on tombs located in Rabu and Naga. The second type of mutances appears now in connection with a building known as the Hall of the Moon, from where they guarded the necropolis in a static pose. It seems that it, it is the complex where the coffin was placed while awaiting the permission of the gods to enter the kingdom of Osiris, after which the procession could continue its journey. First, it is at the entrance of the tomb that these mutances of the second type were depicted and from where they as agents of the kingdom of the dead communicated the approval of the gods for the burial of the deceased. In this role, they act as a kind of demigods, spirits of the deceased kings of Buto that returned from the beyond to intercept the procession and allow the transition of the deceased from one world to the other. The depiction of this type of dancers appears on the first half on the, of the 18th dynasty, from the time of Amose until the reign of Tutmose III, with most of them belonging to the latter. Their location within the tombs is mostly on the left side of the corridor, as is usual for funerary processions. The third types of mood dancers consist of a male couple represented face to face. Because the iconographic differences with the rest of mood dancers, they are also called pseudomu. Both dancers are, the, are depicted in the same posi position and with identical posture, although they are, there are several variants of the pose. They are usually depicted with one or 
their legs and their arms flexed. The variations are mainly related to which leg is flexed, how flexed it is, or even whether one of the arms is, is raised. In any case, the composition of the figures is always symmetrical and clearly recognizable as the third type of mood dancers. They have been related to boatmen, who must have looked back and front while they navigated across the Nile. Their dance could be associated with a folkloric tradition of which they were spared. It is also possible that this type of dance was performed to invoke the actual mood dancers. The aforementioned association with the boatmen is reinforced by the actual function they fulfill, since while the boatmen manage the direction of the boats and propel them through the water, these mood dancers could be responsible for directing the funeral procession and the boats from one side to the other, not only across the river, but also on the night voyage of the sun. These mood dancers appear mostly during the reign of Thunmos III and in the necropolis of Sheikh Abel Kurna. There is no depiction of musical accompaniment in any of these scenes of dancing, while it is common in other scenes of dance. First, these male characters will contact with the gods to approve the burial of the diseases or, or with the underworld to invoke the real mood dancers who will live among the gods. With their performance, the Theban necropolis and the private tombs would be liminal spaces during the funerary procession, and thanks to them, the living, the deceased, and the gods could communicate to make the burial possible. There are also other dance scenes depicted on the private Theban tombs. Most of them are female dancers that appear with orchestras similar to the banquet scenes described before. They are not grouped with them because sometimes we don't have the complete scene, so we cannot know if they are part of a banquet. Another important group is the one formed by acrobatic dances. These dances are found in the New Kingdom private tombs and temples. They are always part of religious processions celebrated during different festivals, such as the beautiful Feast of the Valley or the Opet Festival. The main characters are always women depicted doing some kind of will. They always wear the same short clothing, but there are some variations between the different representations. The position of the hands or the head can change, as we can see on this picture that belongs to the Thief and Tomb 53. Some scholars think that this will movement will make the movement of the dancers possible within the procession, moving forward with these wheels or jumps. These dances can be related to the rebirth of the deceased or to sexuality. The musical accompaniment of these dancers is formed by other women who play the sistrum and the menat necklace, both instruments related to the goddess Hathor. Also related to the goddess Hathor, is one of the dances depicted on the Thivan tomb 82. We can see here two men playing the clappers or castanets and wearing menat necklaces that are instruments linked again with the goddess. The next two characters are male dancers. One of them is jumping, which is something uncommon in dance scenes. The woman on the right is proba probably making some noise with their hands, accompanying this, this way the dance. This scene is inspired by another one found on a Middle Kingdom theme and tomb, but then it was within an agricultural scene. It is, it is remarkable the importance given to the private tombs during the New Kingdom, not only as funerary monuments for the deceased, but also as liminal spaces where these contacts took place during some special occasions, such as the funerals or the celebration of different festivals. They were spaces where to perform different mortuary cults or rituals for which was necessary that the living visited the tombs. First, through the interaction that took place inside the tombs, we can notice how the world of the living and the one of the dead where two realms interconnected and how the tombs were liminal spaces. The structure of the private Theban tombs called chapel tombs because they are places 
of burial and funerary worship is related to the contact between the different realms. But it is also important the decoration of these tombs, both inscriptions and images served as a link between the living and the dead. As mentioned before, the decoration of these tombs changed during the New Kingdom. First, during the 18th dynasty, the biographical scenes and the scenes of daily life are more relevant, while during the Ramesid period, the funerary scenes and tasks are more important. This change takes place because of the religious revolution that occurred during the Amarna period, when Akhenaten introduced the monotheistic cult to the god Aten. Anyway, most of the scenes mentioned in this communication belong to tombs of the 18th dynasty, being the dance scenes less common in the decoration of the tombs of the Ramesid period. As I have tried to, to explain, banquet scenes provide an insight into a, an idealized setting for communication between the living and the dead. They serve to commemorate several generations of relatives representing both the living and the dead in a shared banquet. First, they not represent daily activities, but a banquet that could serve for the eternity where the borders of the different realms were erased. In these banquets, there are some elements that made this communication easier. The musicians and dancers, the alcoholic beverage, the lotus flower and the unguent cones. All of them help the living to get intoxicated and this way communicate with the dead and the gods. Funerary processions carved or painted on the walls of the private human tombs were also a moment of contact between the dead and the gods. In the New Kingdom, they recreated a ritual drama related to the passage of the deceased to the West and his union with the gods. Within this procession, it is important to remark the role of the mood dancers that made the, mood, the burial possible and communicated with the living, the deceased and the gods. Other dance scenes are linked to religious festivities or processions when the population had more access to the deities. Thus, private Theban tomb were liminal spaces where the realm of the living and the realm of the dead contacted with each other. We can see this not only through the decoration of these tombs, but also through some activities that took place near or inside them, such as the banquets or the visit to the tombs when the living also deposited offerings for the deceased, made different petitions, or even some made some inscriptions on the walls of the monuments. Analyzing these interactions within the private tombs, we can notice how the dead remained as active members of the Egyptian society and that the mortuary cult was based on the principle of reciprocity. Thank you very much.